from his vast supplies grace my heart more tender grace to love and pray for sinners that there'll be new grace when it's my time to die oh grace not yet discovered grace not yet uncovered grace from his bountiful store grace to cross the river grace to face forever there'll be new grace i've not needed before oh there's grace 
grace to face forever. Yes, there'll be new grace I've not needed before. I feel like that for the past two Sunday nights, Somewhat like I've been preaching the introduction for our study here in 2 Peter chapter number 1. Uh, it's kind of a peculiar thing for me in the fact that it's, I've really never spent that much time by way of introduction uh, to a study or to a book as we have here in the book of, or for the book of 2 Peter. We have sort of gone, as most of you have probably no doubt, no doubt noticed by now, we have sort of gone all the way around the barn in order to finally walk through the front door, so to speak. If you look there in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 8, the portion of the verse that we had been trying to hone in on there in 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 8, where the Bible says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that so oftentimes, I don't know about you folks, but there are times, to be honest, that I personally feel barren and unfruitful, just to be honest with you. Maybe you say, well, Pastor, that's a terrible thing for the preacher to say. Well, the truth is, there are times that I feel that way. And not only that, but there are times that sometimes maybe some of the members will come to me and maybe they have not necessarily voiced it in the terminology of being barren or unfruitful, but I've had members come to me and say, Pastor, it just seemed like that my Christian life, that I'm, things are kind of stagnant or things are kind of stale. And as I've been meditating upon this for, for quite some time now, the Lord had kind of spoken to my heart through this verse because it says, Therefore, if these thing, things be in you to bound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, beloved, we have striven to show the, the problem of barrenness and unfruitfulness in the life of the believer, the life of the individual believer, in fact, and its effects upon the church. The Bible then says in verse number 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now, beloved, the fruits and effects of being unfruitful. Now, maybe you say, well, Brother Spears, that seems kind of peculiar to take and say the fruits and effects of being unfruitful. But indeed, there is such a thing as having a fruit of being unfruitful. In other words, it is, it is to be stagnant, if you will, or to become somewhat stale. Now, the fruits and effects of that there in verse number 10, where, or verse 9, where the Bible says, But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You see, beloved, it's kind of a frightening thing to me, but according to the Bible, this is not just according to Brent Spears, but according to the Bible, it is entirely possible for a true child of God to come to the place in their life that they find themselves blind. They cannot see afar off. Last week we had spoken on the subject of nearsightedness. They're blind. They cannot see afar off. We forget about our eternal home in heaven. They're blind and they cannot see afar off. And there are times that we can even come to the place that we forget that we have been purged from our old sins. In other words, we come to the point that we begin to live just like the rest of the world. In other words, our affections come to the place that they're set on exactly the same thing as everyone else in the world is. The way that we act, the way that we dress, the things that we worry about, all of those things, we can become just like someone out in the world. Now, that's possible for a child of God to do that. The reason that we have gone around the barn in our study, so to speak, rather than right through the front door is because you must first of all realize that there is a problem before you will ever care about the solution. You must first of all realize that there's a problem before you will ever care about the solution. The Bible tells us they that are whole have no need of the physician but they that are sick. The problem, beloved, which the lost have is that they do not realize that they're lost. The problem with barren and unfruitful Christians is that they do not oftentimes realize that they are barren and unfruitful. In other words, if we're not careful, 
we can come to the point that we may look back at great Christians of old. And, and beloved, we realize that when we say great Christians of old, there's no one that's more saved than anyone else. In other words, Charles Spurgeon was no more saved than I am. Jonathan Edwards is no more saved than any of our men here in the church. But what I'm saying this evening is that we oftentimes look back to the lives of great saints of, of years gone by, such as George Mueller, who had taken and had all of the orphanages in times when children would be hungry. And Miss Brother Mueller would say, well, you know what? I'm going to get down here and I'm going to pray for some food to come in. And time and time and time again, a sack of food. They would hear a knock on the door, go to the door, and there would be a sack of food there on the porch. You see, there are times that we as Christians, we look at people like that and we feel like that kind of a relationship with God, that's just for people in years gone by. In other words, sometimes we feel like that's no longer in effect for Christians in our day and age. I ask of you, if that is what you think, show me a chapter and verse to prove that. It is still in effect for our day and age, you see. It is still in effect that we can be just as spiritual, just as godly as we choose to be, if you will. Now, the problem, once again, is that if we're not careful, we, we kind of come to the place that we view our Christian lives and we kind of feel like, you know what, this is the norm. In other words, what is the difference in Christians today, Christian men today, and men in the past like George Mueller, like David Brainerd, if you will, who were totally committed and sold out to and for the cause of Christ? What's the difference? Why was it that it seemed like if you study their life, they're, they're fruitful, if you will, whereas so oftentimes in our day and age, we're unfruitful. Now the Bible says there in 2, 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 8 once again, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd ask this in the very first message, and we will now delve into it this evening. What are the these things? I know that sounds a little bit like a tongue twister, amen. What are the, these things? Because the Bible says, for if these things be in you and abound, what are these things? What are the things in our lives that if we're not careful that we miss along the way? What are the things that it seems like it desensitizes us? Where we oftentimes, we will look at other people and say, you know what? I know that my life, I mean, I'm not necessarily on fire for the Lord, but as I look around at brother so-and-so, I look around at sister so-and-so, they're not really on fire for the Lord. It seemed like not much more is going on in their life, and it seemed like they're in just about the same position that I'm in, and we can almost look to the lives of other people that are also barren and unfruitful and then justify our own position in it. There was a theologian of years gone by named John Owens, and he used to take and say, that it is a dangerous thing to comfort yourselves in the sins of the saints. It's a dangerous thing to comfort yourselves in the sins of the saints. In other words, if, if someone has a problem with their tongue being too fast or too sharp, and we will look back, well, I, my tongue might be fast and sharp, but so was Peter's, so I guess I'm okay. It's a dangerous thing to do that, you see. Now, once again, we ask the question this evening, what are the, these things which have the power to make us fruitful? Look there in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Beloved, the very first thing, the very first requirement, if you will, if we are to be fruitful, is that you must be born again. Now maybe some of you will sit back and say, well, duh, Brother Spears, boy, that, that really took a degree in rocket science to figure that out. You must be born again. You would not believe, beloved, how many people it is that they do not know the Lord and in their lives they will keep feeling like, you know what, if I just get busy and I begin to produce this fruit, surely that will, will amount to something in the sight of God. Maybe I just need to read another book or go to another seminar. Maybe there's something that I can do in order that I can be the one to start producing this fruit in order to make myself more fruitful. The very first thing is, beloved, you must be born again. You cannot... And you will never bear fruit which is acceptable to God unless you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. It cannot be. You see, you cannot have the fruit of the Spirit without having 
the Spirit himself. It's impossible. The Bible tells us without Christ we can do nothing. Through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Beloved, do you know the Lord today? And once again, I ask you this as a way of laying somewhat of groundwork for this. Because maybe you're here this evening and you look back over your life and say, You know what? If I were to be honest before the Lord, and you might as well be because you can't lie to Him. If you're here this evening and you say, You know what? To be honest, if I were just to take and state the case plainly as it truly is, I didn't feel like I've ever gone through a fruitful time in my life. I didn't feel like there's ever been a fruitful time. Beloved, the very first and the most important thing that you need to do is to make sure that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Make sure you know him. Do not look to all of the externals and try to point to those things, but rather consider the question, do you have a relationship with Christ? We oftentimes use the analogy, even as the Bible uses the analogy, of someone building a house on a rock or building a house on a sand. If there is someone who is building a house or repairing an existing structure, one of the very first things that must be done is the foundation must be right. It has to be right. If you have a house that is out of kilter and it is on shifting sand and you feel like, you know what, the windows are popping out of this house. Here's what we need to do. We need to spend more money for better windows, stronger windows. Let's reinforce the windows. And maybe you will take and spend the time of doing that. Now it seems like the roof line, it's kind of out of kilter. Let's go ahead and readjust all of the tresses on top of the house in order to get all of those things straight. Beloved, you are beating the air to do such things. If the foundation is not right, all of those other things are in vain to do. The most important thing that you can consider, first of all this evening, is do you know the Lord? Now, number two, after we realize, if you're sure this evening, that you know the Lord and the path to being fruitful, the Bible says there in verse number two, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The second prerequisite to being a fruitful Christian is that you must possess a productive knowledge of God. You must. The Bible says grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Now how is it multiplied? How is it multiplied? Maybe we sit back and we say, boy, I'm all about that. I would love to have more grace and peace multiplied. I mean to tell you, I need it in my life. And how can we, does that come about by reading books and going to seminars? Does that come about by all of these things that I do? How is it that that grace and peace is multiplied? That grace and peace is multiplied in our hearts and in our lives through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Beloved, it comes from knowing more about God. A couple of verses relating to this. Look with me in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter number 28 in verse number 9. A very, very common theme throughout the Scriptures. 1 Chronicles chapter number 28 in verse number 9. The Bible says here in 1 Chronicles chapter number 28... In verse number 9, David speaking to Solomon while David was about to vacate the throne, David, some of his final words to Solomon, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Of all of the things that David had that he could tell Solomon about when David was on his way out, the very first thing he says there, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Beloved, if we are to have grace and peace multiplied in our hearts and in our lives, it will come by knowing the Lord, by having a productive knowledge of the Lord. Now, what I mean by a productive knowledge, I believe it was last week or the week before, we'd looked there in Romans chapter number 1 about those who knew God and yet they glorified Him not as God. In other words, they had a knowledge of God, but it was not doing them any good. Look back with me close to our text there to 1 Peter chapter number 3. In verse number 18, that should be 2 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 18. The Bible says there in 2 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 18, the admonition given in the closing of this book, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Peter's admonition 
that is given to us through the Spirit of God, if you will, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Beloved, the, one of the most important things, I will dare say the most important thing, the very most important study that a child of God can ever enter into is a study of God and who God is. The very most important study. Now, I have just a few excerpts that I would like to read from a man. The man, he is not a Baptist, but I believe that he is a Christian. And he had written back in the last century, he says, The church has surrendered her once lofty concept of God and has substituted for it one so low, so ignoble as to be utterly unworthy of thinking, worshiping men. In other words, what the writer is saying is that we have come to the point in many cases, even as the Lord's churches, that we have taken and we have surrendered our once lofty concept of God and we have substituted in its place something else. This she has done not deliberately, but little by little and without her knowledge and her very unawareness only makes her situation all the more tragic. He goes on to say, The low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. You know what, beloved? You know the problem with the world today is that they have a very low view of God. You know, the vast problem with Christians today, beloved, is that so oftentimes we have a very low view of God. That's the problem. He goes on to say, with our loss of the sense of majesty has come the further loss of religious awe and the conscientious of the divine presence. We have lost our spirit of worship and our ability to withdraw inwardly to meet God in adorning silence. Modern Christianity is simply not producing the kind of Christian who can appreciate the, or experience the life of the Spirit. The words, be still and know that I am God, mean next to nothing to the self-confident, bustling worshiper in this middle period of the 20th century. So this was written around the 1950s. This loss of the concept of majesty has come just when the forces of religion are making dramatic gains and the churches are more prosperous than at any time within the past several hundred years. In other words, if you look at religious organizations and churches today, well, I'll tell you what, the buildings are bigger than they have ever been. They're more plush than they have ever been. They're, they're packed out more so than they have ever been. They may have more money in their offering plates than they have ever had. And yet, how is their actual worship? In many cases, it's suffering. Now, he goes on to say there, but the alarming thing is that our gains are mostly external and our losses are wholly internal. And since it is the quality of our faith that is affected by internal conditions, it may be that our supposed gains are but losses spread over a wider field. He says the decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought on our troubles. A rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way toward curing them. It is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right while our idea of God is erroneous or inadequate. Beloved, so oftentimes in our day and age, people will have trouble with things such as devotions, personal devotions, and prayer time. You know why that is? It's because we do not view the Lord in a very high manner. In other words, if we're there on our face in prayer before the Lord and our phone rings and in our hearts and in our minds we sit there and say, you know what, I know that I'm here communing with the God of all creation. I know that this is the most important thing that I, that I can be doing right now, but I'm going to go ahead and check this phone call because it may be that there's someone or something that's more important than God that I need to pull my attention off of this and focus on this phone call. Is that not the truth? When it comes, and once again, I realize this is a Sunday night crowd, and we thank the Lord for every person that is here. But when it comes to the times, beloved, that we have the attitude, you know what, I, I can either go to church and I can meet with the God of all creation because He's promised to meet with His people there in the midst of the assembly, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. He's promised to meet with people, and yet there may be something a little bit more important than God. 
Beloved, this is why so many Christians today are barren and unfruitful. Because in our minds, we think that there are other things that are more important than God. Now, maybe this hurts your feelings. Maybe it ruffles your feathers. Maybe you take and say, well, I can still get to heaven just fine. It, it don't mean that I'm lost and on my way to heaven. No, it don't mean you're lost. But it means that your priorities are misplaced if there's anything or anyone more important to you than God. Now, the writer goes on to say, and we will read just a few more statements here. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Beloved, we're not promoting, and the writer here is not promoting idolatry by any stretch of the imagination. But he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. In other words, if we think about coming to church, we think, you know what? The Lord promised that He would meet with us there, but I'll tell you what, at, at Walmart, they're having a tremendous sale. And, and I'll tell you, I just, I'm torn between this sale at Walmart or meeting with the God of all creation. What you're saying then is that Sam God, Sam, Sam God, forgive me Lord, Sam Walton and the Lord are kind of tugging at your heartstrings. Sam Walton, God. Sam Walton, God, which is which? I mean, what, what, I know I need to go to church. I know God is important. But you do not understand the sale going on at Walmart. And I just struggle with this. Beloved, Walmart, of course, is an expression. I doubt very many people have a struggle between Walmart and church. But you fill in the blank for whatever it is in your life. Whatever it is that hinders you in serving God, then you take and you put that on the same level, the same ground as God. And beloved, whenever we come to that, it can be any of us. And I do not want to stand here this evening and take and say, boy, I'm always dead on the money. I'm never wrong about this. The Lord is always more important. You know what? If it ever comes to the point that it's the last day of deer season, and I sit there and say, man, I still haven't got a deer all season long. And if I don't get one today, it's Sunday. It's the last day of deer season. This is my last opportunity. If there is even a tiny, tiny bit of hesitation or reservation, and I sit there and think, man, the deer are calling me, and it's my last opportunity, then what I'm saying is that getting a deer is as important to me as meeting with God. You fill in the blank for whatever it is in your life. For some people, it may be deer hunting. I, I fill in the blank for whatever it is in your life. That's between you and the Lord. He says there, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion. And man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. You know, beloved, think about someone think about someone that you count to be important in life. Someone very, very, very important. I, once again, you fill in the blank for yourself. I can't fill in the blank for anyone. Whether it, if, if I hate to even say, if someone very, very, very famous were to call you up and say, I want to have breakfast to you tomorrow morning at 7.30, I wonder, beloved, would you get up and be in preparation for that? Would you get up and make sure if you're a man that you're shaved, make sure that your hair is all nice and parted like mine, amen? Would you sit there and take say, man, this guy, I mean, he's so famous, he's so rich. I mean, it may be the former President Bush, if you will. If you were to get a phone call from him, and if you don't like him, that, you, you think of someone else in your own mind. If he were to call you up and say, I want to have breakfast with you tomorrow morning, I will send a limo by and pick you up at 7.30 sharp, and we're going to go to Cracker Barrel and have breakfast. You know, beloved, I don't know about you, but probably I would be pretty, pretty excited about it. And I would probably want to wear some of my best clothes. I would probably use my sharpest razor to part my hair, amen. But I would be pretty excited about that meeting. In other words, I wouldn't walk along and kind of be kicking the ground saying, well, I got to go meet with Mr. Bush. My, my, I, I got to meet with this guy. 
you know what? I may even skip to his limo. Think, man, I want to ask this guy some questions. And yet, how often times, beloved, when we have the opportunity to meet with the God of all creation, do we get up on Sunday morning, and man, we will cut it right next to the wire. Right next to the wire. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll squeeze in there. I mean, if I have a flat tire, it's no big deal. It'll get me out of Sunday school for a while, amen? Yes. If I'm late, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I wonder, beloved, would we have more respect to a breakfast with Mr. Bush or, or Mr. Trump? Or once again, you fill in the person. Maybe who's the coach here of the basketball team, Brother McDowell? Yeah, thanks, Brother Whalen. Anyone who wants to beat Brother Whalen up after the service tonight, amen. If you had the opportunity to have breakfast with such an individual as that, I wonder how would you view that meeting? Would you, be, would you view that meeting to be more important than meeting with the God of all creation? Beloved, I realize when it is put into, the, put into statements like this, we'd all sit back and say, well, no, I mean, of course, it's more important to meet with the Lord. But yet, how much preparation do we truly put into that? For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God Himself. Beloved, this has been a passion of mine for many years now. Sometimes people will take and say, well, children's ministry, that's the heartbeat of the church. If you have a thriving children's ministry, boy, you'll have a thriving church. Sometimes people will take and say that missions is the heartbeat of the church, and boy, if you have a good missions ministry, then your church will be thriving. Beloved, the very most important thing for any child of God, for any church, is to make sure that their focus is upon God primarily. Yeah. And you see, if our focus is upon God the way that it should be, then the missions will be what it should be. If our focus is on God the way that it should be, then our children's ministry, it will be focused in the way that they should be. And whenever we get something lopsided or out of view, or whenever it comes to the point that we take and say, boy, we're going to focus on missions and children's ministry and we will forget about God for a while, you know what? We're in trouble. We're in trouble. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God Himself. The most pretentious fact about any man is not what he is, I'm sorry, is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. Were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes to your mind when you think about God, we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. What do you view God to be like? You see, beloved, the thing about it is that there are many things which a Christian may study, if you will. But look with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16. The Bible says here in Matthew chapter number 16, beginning in verse number 13, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? It is exactly what Mr. Tozier was talking about. When we think about God, who do we believe that God is? Who do we believe He is? What do we believe He is like? Because you see, if you view God to be the big man upstairs and that's it, then you're in trouble. If you view God to be your little helper in the sky, then you're in trouble. If you view God to be your little genie that you can just rub the bottle and He will pop out and He can send help to you when you need help and the rest of the time you'll put Him in the bottle and throw the cork on there, you're in trouble. Because a God such as that is not worthy to be worshipped. A God that we are able to take and tame down and control and maintain and everything else that kind of a God is not worthy of our worship. We can't worship such a God as that. Beloved, I don't know if you folks have ever had a child come up to you. In the child, maybe in their eye, you will see excitement and zeal in the eyes of that child. And they'll be sitting there telling you the most fabulous, wonderful story that they're so excited about. And have you ever tried to show enthusiasm for the child to help them get their story out? 
I dreamed about a unicorn last night, and I now have unicorn bed sheets in my home. Woo, I am so happy. You know what? We as adults, we'll sit there and say, yeah, that's, that's nice. Hey, that's nice little dreams about you. But you know, we're not overly excited about it. And yet, beloved, when people get excited about God and they begin to talk about God, how many times do we have to feign an excitement about it because in our, own, in our own hearts we're not very excited. Beloved, not just for the church but for each and every individual which makes up the church. You see, beloved, if we walk with the Lord throughout the course of the week and we're thrilled about who God is and what He is doing in our lives, you know what, when we come together, man, I've, I've got some things to share with you folks because I'm excited about what he's doing. But if throughout the course of the week we walk according to the same drumbeat the rest, that the rest of this world is walking to, maybe I should say marching to, we march according to the same drumbeat the rest of the world is marching to, when we come together, we don't have many exciting things to say about God. I've got exciting things to say about everything else, everyone else, but not much about the Lord. Beloved, cultivating a relationship with the Lord and getting to know the Lord is the very most important thing that we as Christians can do. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, he had asked Peter there. He said, and Jesus answered, I'm sorry, and he said unto them, but who say ye that I am... The Lord Jesus Christ is about ready to tell them something about himself. But first of all, it was paramount to the discussion that Peter knew who God was. He saith unto him, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. After Peter gave a good testimony about who Christ was, about what Christ was doing, then the Lord Jesus Christ revealed unto him, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, beloved, if a carpenter to walk, were to walk up to Peter and say, Peter, who do you think that I am? And Peter would take and say, well, I heard that you're the son of a carpenter here in town. I heard that you're a pretty good teacher from what I understand. I heard you're the most wonderful musician that the town's people, or musician, magician that the town's people have ever seen because of the things that they have seen you do. Man, they have seen you do some amazing things that no one else has ever done. I heard you're a good magician. I heard you're the son of a carpenter. I heard that you're a good teacher. If that is all Peter believed Christ to be, and Christ were to take and say, I'm going to build my church, Peter would be going around telling people, hey, you know what, there's a new carpenter in town, and he's going to be building a church. Should be pretty neat. I mean, after all, the guy's a carpenter. But you see, when the Christ, the Son of the living God, says, I will build my church. Do you see the difference in the weight of that? I've illustrated it like this. If we take one of our small children, and they're just toddling, and they come up, and they tell you, I've got some scrap pieces of wood and some rusty nails, and I'm going to build something nice for you that you will like, there may be a great deal of sentimental value to whatever it is that the child builds, but in our minds we will sit there and take and say, how good can their carpentry abilities be? How nice of a thing can they make with a couple rusty nails and a couple pieces of wood? And once again, when they're done with that product, it may be very endearing to us. We might take and say, that's precious. There's so much thoughtfulness that went into that. But as far as looking at it and saying, man, that's a top quality wood project, we probably wouldn't be saying that. But if Donald Trump were to come up to you and they could say, you know what, I've got X number of dollars in the bank. I've got access to X number of carpenters and all kinds of people like that. And I'm going to build something for you that you will really like. You know what, we will kind of take a step back and say, man, when I consider the money that this dude's got in the bank, when he says he's going to build something nice, and as I look at the other things that he has built during his time here upon the earth, whatever it is, I don't know what all the man's built, Trump Towers or hotels or golf courses, whatever it is that he's built, when I look at other things that that man has been involved in, and then if he comes to me and he says, I'm going to make something for you that by my estimation, 
by my knowledge, it's really going to be nice. You're going to like it. I'm going to take it and say, man, this is going to be exciting when this man's done. Now, beloved, the point this evening is this. When the Lord Jesus Christ tells him, Peter, who do you think I am? And Peter says, I think that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Christ says, I'm going to build my church. Really? You're going to be putting something together. You're going to build something? You see, beloved, if Peter had a high view of God, then Peter could be excited about the church that God was going to be building. If Peter had a low view of God... He wouldn't be overly excited about it. He just think, yeah, a carpenter is going to be building a church. You see, beloved, all of our biblical studies must rest upon, be built upon the firm foundation of God and who God is. Apart from a solid foundation of knowing God, who He is, how He works, nothing else will really matter. You see, beloved, there are some people who they want to have they don't want to have the cow, but they want the milk for free. What I mean by that is there's some people who they feel like, you know what, I would really love to have spiritual power in my life. I would really love to have the faith of George Mueller, man, to pray food in for those orphans. I would love to have the faith of David Brainerd when he would go out and sleep out under the stars just to be able to minister to the native. I wish that I had that. But you know what, I'm too busy to th spend any time with God. I'm too busy to study anything about the Lord. I'm just too busy for that. Beloved, why are so many Christians today lacking in grace and peace? Because they are anemic in their knowledge of God. Consider how many things that you may know about a person and yet not have an intimate relationship with them. You know, I really... Not to be derogatory, overly derogatory. But you know what? There's a lot of things that I could find out about our president, Mr. Obama. I could probably find out what he normally eats for breakfast. I could probably find out what kind of clothes he wears a lot of times. I can probably find out what time he gets up out of bed. I can probably find out what kind of car he likes. There's a lot of things that I can know about Mr. Obama. Many, 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 many things. I can know the name of his wife, the name of his children. I can know where he was born. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but there are many things that I can know about Mr. Obama, and yet I don't really have an intimate relationship with him. In other words, if someone would come up and say, Do you know Mr. Obama? Yeah, I can rattle off a bunch of things about him that may or may not be true. But as far as actually knowing him, I don't know. Beloved, so many Christians today, they have this knowledge of God that they feel like, yeah, I can rattle off things about God. There's all kinds of things that I know about God. I know He's eternal. I know He's this. I know He's that. There are all kinds of things that people can rattle off about God and yet never truly know Him. Maybe you say, Brother Spirit, does that mean that they're lost? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're lost. It means that they're barren and unfruitful. And maybe we feel like, boy, you know what? Not me. I'm not barren or unfruitful. None of us are as fruitful as we could be. None of us. Now, beloved, once again, the thing is, why are so many Christians lacking in grace and peace? Because they do not know very much about the Lord. As we consider this study for this evening... The Bible is telling us how that we can know more about the Lord. The Bible tells us, look with me in your Bibles to Job chapter number 22 and verse number 21. Job chapter number 22 and verse number 21. The Bible says there, Job chapter number 22 and verse number 21, Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. Throughout the course of our study, there will be some responsibilities given in a few more verses here in 2 Peter chapter number 1. But by way of groundwork, beloved, I feel like that one of the most important things that we can do as Christians today is to acquaint now ourselves with Him. In other words, come to know God in a more and in a realistic way. 
See, beloved, God is, not, God is not a figment of your imagination. God is not a figment of this preacher's imagination. God is not just a projection given forth in the Bible. God is real, and he's living, and he's powerful. And you see, when we come to know the Lord, the Bible says, Once again, acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. How many have ever read our book, Definition of Doctrine, Volume 1? How many have not read our book, Definition of Doctrine, Volume 1? How many do you suppose we have over there on the shelves? For Sister Pemberton, I'm not going to ask her to talk. Give me a sign, Sister. There's probably 50 there, 100 there, or 200 maybe. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of them over there. If we need to, we will put 20 of them in the library, and then people can check those things out. You see, beloved, the amazing thing about it is that there's sometimes that the devil will taste, take and twist our minds up a little bit or our fleshly uh, habits will twist our mind up. And you know what? Those books are over there. And I wonder if, if you've been a member of the church here, isn't it an amazing thing that we're members of the church here and we have those books sitting over there on the shelf and it is one of the best books on the attributes of God that has ever been printed. Brother Cole, tremendous writer. Tremendous book. It really, really, it, it'll light a fire under you if you will get it and read it. Just to contemplate who God is and how He works and what He is doing in your life. You see, beloved, the more that you learn about God, even as the Bible says, Acquaint now thyself with Him and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. And yet, how many times do we come here to this place? We're. 60 paces from the book, you think? We print them. We print them. We could almost probably have a church vote that every family that wants one could have one for free if you would take it and read it. Consider how close we are to growing in the knowledge of God, and yet we don't do it. What are the things that edge out our study on the knowledge of God? Is it a TV show? There's nothing wrong with having a time of relaxation, enjoying a TV show. But I'll tell you what will be far more rewarding is to read even a chapter of that book every night or every morning. It'll be a blessing to your heart. You see, beloved, I don't know about you folks, but there are times that I will invest my time into something. I don't know if I'm peculiar about this or not. Sometimes on normally I will take Mondays off and my wife will say, well, why don't you just sit down here and relax? Just, just kick back and relax for the day. My idea of relaxing, and I know you'll probably want to have me locked up after this, my idea of relaxing is to go out and cut and split firewood. Yeah. At the end of that day, I just, I enjoy it. I, I look back at that pile of firewood and I feel like that I've accomplished something. But there are some times that I'll think, you know what, I'm just going to kick back here in the chair and I'll watch the idiot box. That's the TV. You know what, at the end of that day, I'm kicking myself saying, what have I done? I've done nothing but waste my time and I'm not improved one iota. If I had a cut and split firewood, I'd have something to show for it. If I'd read a good book, I'd have at least something to show for it. You see, beloved, there are times that we allow our indulgences to overrule our lives. And the sad thing is that it's very seldom that I will ever start watching a movie and stop halfway through it. There have been times that I've done that, if there's too much cussing or something like that, that I'll take and say, I'm not going to finish it. But you know what? Normally you will watch it. Sometimes I've started reading a book. And I'll think, I'm going to finish the book. And maybe I'll see something in the book, and I'll think, I'm not going to finish it. This is ridiculous to waste my time reading this. And, but I'll, think, well, I'll go ahead and read it all the way to the end. Maybe it's going to get better. I'll just keep reading. Maybe it'll get better. And maybe you go on to the end of the book, and it never does get better. And you think, I've done nothing but waste my time. Beloved, beloved any effort that we put towards learning and knowing more about God, I promise you this, it will not be wasted time. It will be time well spent. If you want some of those books, they're over there. You can fight Sister Pemberton to get them. Amen. No, you don't have to do that. If someone wants one of those books per family and you will take it home and read it, I believe that we can work that out. If not, 
Brother Whalen will pay for every last one of them, amen? But if you would read one of those books and take it home, just a chapter a day, it wouldn't take you 10, 15 minutes to read a chapter. Maybe some of you 20, maybe me 30, amen? But it will be time well spent. And the grace and the peace of God will be multiplied in our lives through the knowledge of God. Let's all stand, please.